Bose is the presenting partner of Beyond the Grid. That's because Bose QuietComfort 35 II goes beyond what you would expect from a pair of headphones. Just flip the switch to experience the industry-leading active noise reduction feature and all distractions of the world around you fade away, allowing you to focus fully on what matters to you. I am Alain Prost and you are listening to Beyond the Grid. Hello gang, it's TC here with another edition of Beyond the Grid. Now we've had some legends on this show over the past few weeks, but this time I'm talking to someone who can rightly be regarded as one of the greatest of all time. I first saw him in action at the 1983 British Grand Prix at Silverstone. At the time, he'd yet to win a world title, but I remember being mesmerised by him and his bright yellow Renault RE40 from my vantage point on the outside of Beckett's. He won that day and he'd go on to win a total of 51 races and take four world titles. And his battles with Ayrton Senna would become the stuff of legend. I'm talking, of course, about the professor himself, Alain Prost. Over the years, I've been lucky enough to spend a bit of time with Alain, and it's always been a privilege. We've even cycled up the famous Tour de France climb of Alp d'Huez together, and for the record, I didn't see him for dust. This chat, though, was the first time we'd sat down at a... We talked about a lot, and not just the obvious, and I was hanging off his every word, particularly when it came to discussing his great rivalry with Ayrton Senna. I hope you enjoy our chat as much as I did. Welcome to Beyond the Grid. Thank you for your time. Now, this is getting a bit ridiculous, because you still look as lean and fit as you were when you were racing. And that was 25 years ago. Now, is there any truth in what I've just said? Uh, yeah, even uh, even worse than that. I'm, uh, I'm carry, carry less weight. And uh, I, I mean, I'm as fit. For sure, the body is okay. I mean, the head, you can see that is a few few more years. <laughs> uh, but I'm quite pleased about that. But it's a, it's a challenge, you know. It's becoming more and more difficult. But, I mean, just tell us, how do you keep in, in, in good shape? So so you're, you're lighter than you were as a driver. Is it predominantly cycling? Uh, yeah, cycling, the food, and uh, being healthy. I mean, the sport, and uh, yeah, a little bit. Uh, the, 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 my life is like this, but it's not... Uh, you have to be careful when you're talking about wet today because there's a lot of people are concerned about their wet and whatever. But for me, it's very different. I'm not trying to, to lose wet. You know, it's, uh, it's in my, uh, all, all my life I've been around the sport. I've been at uh, the football school at eight years old. And uh, if I don't do a sport, if I don't do a physical training, I really don't feel well, you know. For example, we were talking now in Singapore, I'm going to have three days without any sport because I don't want to go to the gymnasium. I was going, I, I'm going to do some exercise in my room, stretching and uh, a little bit of I mean, exercises, but it's my life. I don't try to find something, you know. I just want to be healthy. I just want to be uh, okay with my body. But let, let's talk um, Renault now, because, of course, you're, mm. you're working with Renault. Yeah. Your second stint, really, isn't it? We'll come, we'll come on to the first stint in, in the 80s a yep. bit later. But talk about the team now. Um, let's talk Daniel Ricciardo. Mm. Um, big news in recent weeks. What's he going to bring to the team in 2019? I think what Daniel can bring is, uh, obviously, the first thing is the, himself. That means, <laughs> you know, he's a driver. He has won races. Uh, he has been... Um, so competitive during the last few years. He is a very nice personality, which very which is very important also for the team, for outside, for the people. He is also coming from a winning team. That means, you know, there is a, as a old driver, I mean, you can see that when you are in the top team and you are an average team, there is a lot of small differences that can uh, make Obviously, the difference in competitivity. A driver like him can help. You know, uh, we 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 need to put everything we can. You know, all together to become a top team, and he is part of uh, he's part he's part of that. Um, the marketing side is good value. Um, there's a he's lot. Funny, isn't he? He's properly funny. He's he's a funny funny guy. Is uh, if you talk about Daniel, 
inside Formula One, outside Formula One is that you have never controversy. You have, uh, but uh, you, you need to remember. For me, was or is maybe one of the best driver to overtake people. He's uh, very competitive. He has he has got more points than uh, his teammate very very often. Uh, like uh, like Max, which is, we is considered maybe one of the one of the best. He is is a top guy, and in in a team like uh, Renault, when you're going to a big team like this, big factory, but we. It's uh, the Renault family is uh, it's a lot of uh, long history in Formula One, but you know it's uh, it's also a big company. It's a generalist constructor, and you need to have a you need to have a good ambience. It's uh, it's very difficult, you know, to support the pressure of this, uh, and we need to have two drivers working well together, being uh, um, you know getting along, you know, without any problem. And I'm sure that with Daniel and Nico is going to be a good. Uh, Good team. Is he the final piece of the jigsaw? Do you feel that with him you can take the fight to Mercedes, Ferrari? And if yeah. you ask me this kind of question, very honestly, I'm going to answer that was maybe a little bit. It, it is maybe a little bit too soon <laughs> uh, because we are not there. But uh, when we talked to Daniel, it was a very uh, frank discussion. That means he, he knows everything. He has seen everything. He knows that he cannot be world champion next year. We are going to be better for sure, but uh, he will take time. But he's ready to. to we were a bit surprised that uh, when he when he said yes, I want to, I want to come. Is uh, uh, but um, he's going to also allow us to push the team to become even better and better all the time. So it's a little bit more pressure on the team because of uh, him. And uh, but at the end, it's positive pressure. Now, how different is is the Renault that we see in Formula One today compared to the Renault that you race with between eighty one and eighty three? Is there any comparison that we can make? There's always a comparison because uh, the the only comparison uh, I told you a little bit of that when you're talking when you were talking about Daniel. Is uh, everything has changed? Obviously, because uh, in from the 80s, 81 to 83, we had everything built in Viry Châtillon, chassis and engine. It was a French team, uh, French tires, French uh, people. Um, I don't remember if we had one uh, one English mechanic, for example. I even do not remember. And the decisions were we had the managing director, we had a, let's say a team principal was Gérard Larousse at the time, but. Uh, the big decisions were were made by the you know the top people uh, in Boulogne, you know, and uh, that was really very honestly a problem. That was uh, if we have not been world champion, some decisions were absolutely strange in uh, in this motor racing uh, environment, and it became uh, so. The thing you could say. Uh, that has changed completely. You know, we are more in the racing spirit. Uh, we are half English team, and uh, we know that uh, to be to perform, you have to be you have to be there. You have to be in England. Uh, engine are still in Viri, but it's not a, it's not a problem. We have the expertise, we have the knowledge, and uh, but the the culture of the company, the mentality is is still there, even if the people have changed. That means it's still a, Renault is a generalist constructor. Is not a Ferrari or is not a Mercedes or is not Audi. Uh, we are fighting against top top people, but you, it's normal that you 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 always keep this kind of uh, you know uh, mentality and uh, uh, in uh, in your heart. You know, so we are not doing exactly the same the, the same thing. What is the most important is the management side is is very different. Okay, now eighty three. I mean, talking about those those first three years with Renault. I mean, eighty two. Alan, I've got this theory that you should be a nine time world champion. I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> because actually, <laughs> there were five championships yeah. that you came incredibly close to. Yeah. Eighty three. Well, actually, eighty two. If the thing hadn't no, kept breaking 82 down. Eighty two was maybe. I mean, eighty two, eighty three was uh, was the. the Worst years, obviously, because eighty-two, you know, it's uh, more than thirty years later. You can say exactly what what happened. In eighty-two, we had a, 
a failure. I had nine times in the year the same failure when I was uh, almost leading the race, yeah, almost every, every time. And uh, that was the small uh, electrical engine that uh, was cost, I don't know, maybe 30 euros today or 50 euros, whatever. But it was part of a company uh, linked b with Renault. We could have changed that. That may mean nobody could, uh, but on the Eng English uh, philosophy, you would have changed that and then say nothing to anybody and we would, not, would have been world champion. But because it was a company linked to Renault, we were not allowed to do that. That when I was talking about management, that is part of the decision you could, you could make at the time. And we have not been world champion. That was really a big, uh, you know, disappointment. So was 82 almost 80. more frustrating than 83, bizarre? Where you missed out in 83 by yes, two points. Yes, I, I tell you why. Because 82, it is really a decision of the management we have made uh, us not world champion. 83, it's another decision of the management, but it was, uh, you know, the, 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 the situation with the fuel. We had two things. We had the turbo, you know. So we, we had exactly the same problem than 82. We were with uh, uh, KKK, if I remember, and we could have go, uh, go to Garrett. It was uh, because uh, we were limited. Uh, uh, you know, during the season, we were putting more boost and more, more, more power, but the turbo could not accept that. And uh, then, in fact, we had a reliability problem, but they did not want to, did not want to, to do it. They did not want to change. That is one, uh, one aspect. And the second one, which was the worst, we knew about the fuel. It has been controlled. It has been uh, through the, you know, the health people and other other people. We knew that it was not uh, it was not okay, but Renault at the end they did not want to to um, to protest at the end because maybe because it was another constructor. You know, at the time it was different, and only the the um, the. the um, the team by itself can protest. I mean, I could not protest as a driver, you know, it's not... Uh, so that was really, uh, really disappointing because it's being a champion is, uh, you know, we were looking of, uh, of that and, uh, and Renault as a team at the time has never been world champion, has never been successful after. Yeah. So how... And then, so, so you leave Renault at the end of 83. Yep. You then go to McLaren where you miss out by half a point to Nicky Lauda. Yep. How frustrated were you at this point in your career? Because you were the fastest driver in Formula One, and yet for whatever reason, you couldn't get that championship. Where, talk me through that winter of 84, 85. Yeah, in fact, it's another season, another, another ambience. Uh, you know, when I, the funny thing, when I came to McLaren, Nicky has a contract of being number one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I signed a contract being number two. <laughs> and you were yeah. happy to sign that? I was happy to sign because, <laughs> I mean, he, he was number one, but it was not a number one like today, where uh, if he was uh, behind me, uh, I, I had to, to leave uh, the way, you know, that did not work like this. But when we were testing, he, was, he wanted to test the development. If, he was, if we had only one f front wing, for example, he would have uh, the front wing for him. I have accepted that. And in fact, I never felt uh, a, big, uh, a big problem. But we had such a good year <laughs> all together, uh, you know, with the team, with Nikki, that at the end, when you lose, but losing again was, uh, and also for half a point, um, I, I did a good season. I had more problems, maybe more failure. Uh, I did uh, I did mistakes too because I was fighting a lot against uh, Nelson, and uh, Nikki was always uh, behind, but got got the points. Uh, so, you know, uh, you know what was the the most difficult part of it? Uh, if you ask me, winter eighty four, eighty five is uh, I was reading sometimes newspapers, which I never do for a long time, but, uh, and I was reading Alain Prost will never be world champion, you know, because I missed so much, you know, uh, championships that, uh, so I said to myself, I have, I have to consider this 85 year as, a, as, a, as my year. I, I have to do everything to be, to be world champion, even if I have to, secure uh, fourth or fifth position, I have to work differently. You know? and, and did you work differently? Yeah, I, I worked differently. I worked differently. I wanted, uh, my objective was to be a world champion. I have, uh, 
I, I was very careful, you know, but uh, but not, but you know, uh, we had some uh, I had some races. Um, was it in '85 when uh, I spun, you know, in the straight in uh, Estoril uh, when it was wet? Then I had the the. You know, I was running 600 grams below in Imola after my win, so I lost the win. So I, I'm beginning of 85. I said to myself, "Okay, this is going to be another <laughs> another year." It was really uh, really difficult, but I got it. You know, you say you did things differently. Was that a sort of from the moment you turned up at a racetrack, your focus was on Sunday more yeah. than Saturday? Y- yes, in fact, uh, that started with with Nikki in '84 uh, because. Uh, I remember, you know, I was also very close to Pierre Dupasquier, you know, the person from Michelin, where I was working a lot with him. By the way, it's it's um, him and uh, and around around them that they call me the professor because of this. Uh, Pierre this, Dupasquier. Yeah, in fact, it was the the person uh, in charge of the communication of the Michelin Racing Department. They called me the professor because in, at one race, I think it was '82 or '83, where I I have decided to put the the hard tire on the left and soft tire on the right, and he said, "Oh no, no, it's not going to work. You can't do that." I said, let, "Let me do. I am I am doing all the preparation of the car for the race for." For that, you know, so let me do. You will see uh, for sure. I, I know that's going to work, and, uh, and then I I won the race, and uh, that's where they call me the first time the professor. But that's a great anyway. story. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, yeah. and uh, in fact, he, I remember him. I don't know exactly which. Uh, he said, you know, uh, you have to, you cannot drive the car at 100 percent all the time. Uh, when he was saying 100 percent all the time, that mean not only races but qualifying or free practice but also private test during the week i was driving at 100 percent but that was in 80s 82 maybe 83 and then when i arrived with nikki nikki was slower than me there was no doubt about it but at the end he was world champion for any kind of reason but sometimes he was starting eight nine ten i was on first row you know but he was still uh, still able in the rest to be to be competitive and uh, I really changed my philosophy a little bit. It's not only because of Ayrton. When Ayrton came, I, I went even more to this philosophy. But I was uh, I was more like this because it's, uh, at the end of the day, you only got points uh, on the rest, not in qualifying. Those 80s, I mean, it, it, people hark back to those 80s and at uh, the 80s and say, you know, it was a halcyon era, a brilliant era of Formula One. Mm. Would you agree with that? The cars, the drivers. Yes, for sure. Is uh, because uh, f- first of all, we were all learning. We were all at the beginning of a, of a story. Formula One before the eighties was not exactly the same, no. And uh, we we had, uh, I mean, different races with different teams, different constructors. But uh, uh, most important is. Um, the, the technical regulation. We had the freedom, you know. We, we had the, you know, they have to find the, the way, you know, to adjust between the eight. Can you remember that w- at one stage we had eight cylinder, 10 cylinder, three type of 12 cylinder, Ferrari, Lamborghini, Alfa Romeo, and uh, and turbo engine all together, you know. So it was really unbelievable. But Eclectic. Yeah, yeah. the good thing is that sometimes when, if you had a turbo car in the early 80s, you go to Monaco, you go to uh, some places like Montreal, you knew that it would be very difficult and struggling. But some, if you go to Monza or to uh, Silverstone, you, have, you had a chance to win, you know. And uh, it, it was a different philosophy. The drivers, they had uh, an unbe- unbelievable personalities and, and charisma, you know, because I think they were... Coming from a, a different level, different age, also, you know. Uh, when you if you arrive at uh, 25, 27 in Formula One, he was uh, already, I mean, young, <laughs> you know, at the time. So also we had uh, uh, to 
to arrive to Formula One, we had to do different things, you know, and uh, by by uh, uh, ourselves, you know. So it, it was a different, and we had fun, you know, and we had a lot of fun, and we had a lot of risk, a lot of accident, and as I. Th- I really thought a lot that if we had so much fun, it's also because it was so dangerous and we were almost like family and uh, all together. We, we, we had some stories like everywhere, like in a, in a big family, but most of the time we were really friends. You talk about danger. How much did you worry about danger and hurting yourself? And I mean, how much damage did you do to yourself in a racing car in your career? I had uh, I had a lot of accident in the uh, 80s with McLaren. The first year at McLaren, uh, I had nine mechanical failures on the car during the year. Uh, two or three times I went in the the hospital, uh, especially in private tests. I remember in Donington, I was really uh, I was really bad, and uh, I took also the wheel on my my face in uh, Watkins Glen, the last race in the 80s. That's where I decided to to stop. I, I hurt myself, but the first or second race in KLME, I broke, I broke my scaphoid. And that's where I realized that uh, you can hurt yourself in uh, motor racing. Because before you do not have any f- physical pain, you don't know that can happen. I remember I was really close to Gilles Villeneuve at the time, 80, uh, 80 81, before his accident. And uh, it was really a, a strange guy talking about the risk uh he was so so nice he's one of my best uh, you know friend in in formula one at the time but he was keeping saying to me you know and i we we can't hurt ourselves in formula one it's not possible he has had an unbelievable accident i don't remember I, I don't know if you remember when he went over you know the crowd i don't know where it was and he never hurt himself you know he never he never felt the pain and he thought that uh, you cannot hurt you, yourself. But, you know, these, these two things, you know, myself, I hurt myself. I had uh, f- um, a lot of bad accident with uh, mechanical failures. And on the other side, I've seen uh, good friends and very close, uh, close guys uh, uh, being killed or being very badly injured. So from the beginning, I really took care about the, the safety. And when you're asking the question about, uh, you know, preparing the car for the race, uh, that was also a sort of philosophy that trying to get less risk possible, put everything that you can on your side. Uh, you know, I give you an example. At the time, we had the T car. T car. If you ask me why I did not do 24 hours of Le Mans at the time, it's because you had to share your car. And I remember I had a good friend of, uh, of mine also. He was my manager the first year, Jean-Louis Lafosse. He has died in uh, 24 hours of Le Mans because he took the car at one stage and uh, his teammate was uh, going over the curbs all the time. And then he, he had a suspension failure in the straight. And uh, it's very difficult to rely on everything and everybody in this business, you know. And when we had the T car, I can say that uh, I had some drivers where I was very confident with. For example, Nicky, when we had the T-car, I didn't have any problem. I knew that he had the same philosophy. I knew that he, for example, if he goes over a curb in a very bad way, he's going to ask the engineers or the technical director, okay, can you check that, can you check that, or replace the suspension or whatever. He has the same philosophy. Not all drivers have the same thing. So you have to put everything in your on your side. And that's why the... If you minimize the risk, that does not say that uh, you have no chance to hurt yourself, but you you put, again, everything on your side. Now, the drivers in the 80s, you, yep. you've talked a little bit about the, the camaraderie among you. PK, Mansell, Rosberg and Lauda, can you put them in speed order in your That's opinion? That's my teammates, yeah? Yeah. PK? Uh, no, Pique was no, no, Pique not wasn't Pique. a teammate, was yeah. it? No, but they were the sort of, the, you were the, yeah. the main guys uh, of the Pique, era. Mansell? Pique, Mansell, Rosberg and Lauda. Uh, the quickest on one lap would be Nigel, I think. Uh, and uh, when I had uh, Kike, I don't think he was in his best year in 86. Very difficult to judge. I think when he saw in uh, the beginning of the year, I don't... 
I don't know if he has not if he had not decided already to retire at the end of eighty six. Very difficult to judge. But if you compare Nigel, Piquet and Lauda, uh, Nigel was maybe the quickest. But uh, Piquet and Lauda are much more difficult to beat uh, if you're talking about the championship. They are, they are much, much more complete drivers, you know. In Lauda and Piquet. Lauda and Piquet, for sure. Well, you, you still managed to get Mansell to retire. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's my fault, but uh, in it's more his fault. <laughs> what is it about you forcing your teammates into retirement? Rosberg, yeah. a season with Alain Prost, I'm gone. Lauda, the same. Mansell announces his yeah, retirement. I mean, for since. sure, uh, with uh, KK, KK was one of my best teammates. He was really a friend too. He was really, really good. But for sure, yeah, he did not... Uh, maybe he did not get along also with the McLaren philosophy and uh, the philosophy also to set up the car. Uh, but he was, uh, he, he was good. Uh, Nigel is different. He's, uh, he's Nigel. He's, uh, I never understood why he was... Uh, for example, he was jealous because I was uh, speaking Italian. And, but if you start like this, you cannot, <laughs> cannot, you know, with Nikki, we never had any problem. Never, never any argument in two years. We'll get back to Alan in a moment. But before we do, I want to tell you about an amazing opportunity that our friends at DHL are offering one lucky fan. As you might already know, DHL are the official logistics partner of F1. So they're used to operating behind the scenes of a Grand Prix. But now they're offering you the chance to do the same and get in front of the camera in the process. So if you fancy yourself as an F1 broadcaster, and who doesn't, then why not see if you've got what it takes to become DHL's super fan reporter? If you're successful, you'll find yourself at the United States Grand Prix in Austin with me and the rest of the F1 media rabble, getting up close and personal with the drivers, covering all the action from the pit lane to the paddock and providing a unique look at all the goings on within the F1 fan zone. Now, I regularly host the FIA F1 press conferences and you could be in the room too, as well as shadowing broadcast partners and taking over F1 social media channels with daily video updates. It sounds great, doesn't it? So if you think you've got what it takes, then simply upload a video of you showcasing your broadcasting skills by analysing a winning DHL fastest pit stop from this season. And if you show you deserve your place in the paddock, you could be on your way to Austin. So to enter and win the chance to become DHL's super fan reporter at the US Grand Prix, please visit dhl.com forward slash behind the camera. That's dhl.com forward slash behind the camera. Now let's get back to the professor. Your rivalry with Senna, um, it's well documented. You've been asked a lot of questions about it. Did you have the power of veto at McLaren? Could you have prevented him coming to the team? More than the power of veto. I've asked Ron and Honda to put Ayrton in the team. You asked them? Yeah. Yeah, because it was very simple. We were in Japan in a meeting in the hotel room. And uh, that was already the year before when we started the negotiation. We had a a small chance to get the engine for 87, but we missed it. And uh, they wanted to put Prost and Piquet in the future. And I said, why Nelson? And Nelson was a good friend also. You know, we were getting very well. I, and Ayrton, I did not know him. I only met him once in, uh, in Germany for Mercedes, uh, you know, race in uh, Nürburgring. And uh, I said, why do you want to take the, the Nelson? You know, we have a young guy, he's a very talented driver. We need to have the best for the team. And that started like this. I had the veto. I could say no, for sure. Yeah. So, given everything that happened, do you regret? I never regret uh, anything. Because when you do things, uh, you, do, you, do, you do it when, because you feel that is the best. At the time, I can regret that uh, the, the, the relation in the McLaren family have changed because of that. But... You need to remember, and you need to ask Ron, from 84, the day I went to McLaren to 88, when Ayrton came, we always took decisions all together. When, when Ron had to find a sponsor, I was going with Ron to the meetings. You know? We were doing everything all together. 
I was really part, not of the family. I was really like part of, like, like a shareholder, you know. So we were taking the the, the, the decisions for the for the good of the of the team, you know, to make it better. So that's why I've I've said that. I said because it was better for the team. I did not think about myself first, you know. I never never ask any position of a number one driver in a team for all my career. I've never been a number number one. And I've even been number two <laughs> at least once, you know. <laughs> so uh, I, I was not in this in this philosophy. In the modern Formula One, Ayrton started to to ask for a number one uh, uh, situation. Obviously, we had Michael, and then now we have Lewis and and Sebastian. We do not, we should not hide that, you know. It's part of the. And uh, on the other side, there's some teams, like Ferrari, for example. If I was a number one on the paper. In 1990, I would have been world champion. You know, so you have to understand that sometimes in different teams, in different situations, being a number one, having a number one and a number two in team can can work very well. So you invited Ayrton in. Obviously, we know what happened. Are you pleased that you had that rivalry? Would you say it's the defining moment of your career? No, it's a. It's it's always the on the sportive side. Uh, I think it's good. Uh, on the human side, it was very very difficult for me because uh, Ayrton was supported. Uh, I mean, ninety nine percent by the media, by the people. Not not inside the team. Inside the team, it was uh, was more Honda and Ron because Ron has always. Uh, uh, what we call uh, protégé or chouchou. I mean, he, he always take a driver under did himself. You, did you feel Ron's loyalty shift away from you towards yes, that? Yes, sure. But I felt, I felt a little bit when I was uh, with Nicky, you know, from the beginning to the end. I felt that also in my favor with uh, Keke. I felt that uh, with Stefan. So that's the first time I felt the, <laughs> the opposite. But... Uh, if you if you had the the relation I had with uh, with Ron and Mansour and with the team in the past, you understand also his philosophy. You understand his motivation to build the best re- uh, racing team. So sometimes you can uh, forgive forgive him, you know, because he wa- he, he was thinking about the future, or thinking about the relation with Honda. And uh, it's always in his uh, in his temper, you know, in his uh, in his philosophy. So I had no problem. But on the human side, I promise you that was really really tough. But at the end, we made the history. We we had a, we had a, uh, such a, a period where I mean, almost not one day or one week that somebody do not, does not talk to me about that. So we realize more now, you know, 20, 30 years later, what we have done. Now, Emila 89 seems yep. to have been the catalyst yep. when the agreement about Turn 1 yep. was mm. um, broken. But why did, it, why did things escalate so quickly after that? Well, it's very simple. Uh, the, the story is when, the, when that happened in Imola, uh, we had some people like John Hogan, for example, he was, uh, he was there in the motorhome when we met the, the agreement. The agreement, we have done this kind of agreement two, three, four times already. In, uh, because we, we wanted to rest together. We did not want to, you know, to, to have an accident the first corner. That's what he was saying, but uh, <laughs> sometimes it was very close. But we did not want to have a Ferrari, for example, over, or overtaking us uh, in the first corner. So it was a, a normal situation. After, after Imola, it was so bad, and John Hogan was also a little bit upset about, about this situation. Just to clarify to people listening, John Hogan was in charge of Philip, he, the Philip Morris, Philip Morris money. Yeah, exactly. And he was the only person in, in Motoron when we met, uh, we met the agreement. And then uh, Ron has decided to, because we were testing the week after in, uh, in Scotland, in Pembury, I think. Wales. Uh, in Wales? Sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. I don't know. Scotland would be not in, killed. In England. So okay. <laughs> in Pembury. <laughs> and then uh, Ron has decided to, to come and to, to meet Anton and myself to talk about that. And that was really, really strange, you know, because uh, 
uh, Ayatollah started to say, no, it's, yeah, it's not me, I've broken the deal, it's Alain. He overtook me before the first corner. And no one said that, please, uh, uh, Ayatollah. And at the time, that was 30 years <laughs> ago, we put the, the tap, you know, the big tap in record, and then uh, they said, you know, it's, I don't know, but hundreds of millions of persons have, have seen what happened. And then um, I said that today, but we have to understand that Ayatollah did not feel well, you know, almost. Right. And I had, uh, I talked to one journalist, a French journalist, uh, about this story, but... Johnny like, Reeves. Johnny Reeves, yeah. From L'Equipe. From L'Equipe. Like uh, off. You know, we were talking very often off. That, that was the time. From 80 to 89, you were able to speak off with some journalist. After 89... I almost did not say, I mean, very, very little of things with some journalist record, or some yeah. of the record, mm. because it's, uh, it did not work. And then Johnny made an article of that, and he was so upset that he did not talk to me anymore during this year. Yeah. And that, that is the reason of, uh, of, the, of the problem. I mean, do you, do you regret that you couldn't just sit down and sort it out? Or was it just too no, difficult? No, it was too difficult because we, we, uh, you, you, you can't talk about... You have to listen what I'm going to say because that's why I'm very upset about the film Sena. Because you can't talk about this story, that means our story, when we were racing all together, together without understanding what happened after I retired, all the discussion we had together with Ayrton during the winter before his accident. And then you, if you understand that, you understand why he was like this, what, what was his motivation. And obviously he's a, he's a strange person. If you ask me, you know, all the names you have um, uh, said before, Mansell, Piquet, Osberg, uh, Damon, all these guys, you know, they are all different, you know, but Ayrton is special, he's very special. So you cannot, I am very, I'd say, Cartesian, you know, uh, so it's very, very easy to, to read, you know, what I think, what I say, and uh, Ayrton is different. So you cannot, you cannot judge, you cannot sit and, and talk, you know, I have invited him once, in my house in Switzerland when we were in the Geneva Motor Show. He did not talk. He did not say one word, you know. He was sleeping in, in, a, in a canopy after, after lunch. And uh, I went to, to the Geneva Motor Show and I talked to the Honda guy who was a friend of mine. I, said, I, I explained to him what happened. He said, no, no, uh, don't worry. He told me that he has done that. I said, yeah, why? Because he did not want to talk to you because he does not want to become a friend. He has to fight against yourself. He doesn't want to become a friend, doesn't want to become close. It is very difficult when you have this kind of... But you understand everything. But you understand after. You always understand after in, in life, <laughs> you know? And it's... Uh, that's why I don't regret. He was like this, I was like this. We had a different personality, different culture, different education, uh, different way of uh, driving, different way of set, um, set up the car, whatever. We were all different. But that is, that is part of our success. That's why. So, so that winter before he died, when you said you had lots of conversations, do you feel, I don't know whether you're prepared to share anything that you'd spoke about, but do you feel that was when you started to understand Senna? Yeah. Was that winter? Sure, because he started to talk. The, the, Did you talk about 88, 89, 90? He talked about everything to me. He was calling me, let's say, one or twice per week, and we had a long conversation. He wanted me to come back. When I tested the McLaren uh, uh, Peugeot engine, he said, oh, you should come back. I was laughing on the phone. He said, yeah, I'm going to come back, and you're going to be uh, one lap ahead of me, and uh, why do you want me to do that? <laughs> I was explaining to me all, all the things. You know? I, I, understood, uh, I understood a lot on the, on the human side which was the most, uh, the most important. I've heard people say that you became friends. Is, yeah, is I, that true? I, I, I don't know if you can, if you can say friends, but when, when a guy like him changed completely his mind, when we were on the podium in Adelaide, you know, 
when we were together on the first March of Podium. We had pictures and then we went to the press conference. He changed completely the way he, he was with, with me. And from this day, I mean, a few days later, he called me. He was the first one to call me. And then he kept going during the winter. But we, uh, I can call that a friend because when you, when you start to talk about your professional life, but personal life, your worries, your, your problems, what he has done during the winter before his accident. And I always said, I know something that I will never share to anybody. I never, I never talk to anybody, even person of my family, because that was a secret. So I can say, yes, in this way, he is a friend. But I never met him very often after, you know, after his, uh, his accident. But uh, yeah, I mean, we, we share a lot of things. He was not very happy about his life, uh, I mean, even even at, uh, inside his team, and uh, he was worried about, uh, you know, the, the, the Benetton not being uh, uh, conformed, correct, and uh, about safety, that before he was not talking very much about safety. Uh, but yeah, he had, he had a lot of things that uh, he, he became a, a sort of... A, a, not weak, but uh, a different person. He was... Without you? Yeah, because he said to me, I cannot be motivated by these guys. He was telling me some names. I cannot be motivated by these guys. And then I have, uh, he had a lot of... Uh, all the, What was his strength before was really like a sort of weakness, but he was still quick, was still uh, good. No problem about that, but he was completely different. Yeah. Do you think he enjoyed Formula One, or was it the whole process for him was just too intense? I think the whole process was too intense because he wanted to, to beat me. His first motivation was, I was a target. I was talking to you before about the target, you know, in life. You, you, when you have a target, maybe the target was not the correct one, but... Uh, you know, he was for sure maybe one of the best of the world, you know, anyway. But uh, when he lost his motivation, he lost his target, uh, he lost the goal, he, he, had, he had to find a new goal. Being another time world champion is, was not enough. That's what I felt. And he had to find a, a goal also in his private life. And uh, it, everything was confused at the time. He, wa he went from a McLaren family to a Williams environment, which is not the same, not easy, especially also for a South American guy. And uh, everything was, uh, you know, almost uh, changed his, uh, his mind and his life during, the, during one winter. Did he ever talk to you about retirement or...? Retirement? For him to retire? No, 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 we did not talk, uh, did not talk okay. about that. No. Now, back to you, Williams. It's interesting to hear you say that Williams is a different environment. Yep. Um, to McLaren, let's compare the two English teams. How how different was it, and why do you think it was different? I think it's a uh, it's an English team. So I remember when I went to Williams, it's, uh, it gives you a you know it's a, it's a racing team, you know. Yeah. But uh, the human side is is really <laughs> at the second. Uh, it's behind the door, if you want, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Patrick and Is Frank that, are quite hard, right? Yeah, but I, I love them. Yeah. I love them. They are, they are racers, you know? I, I really love Patrick. He was, I had a good relation with him, good, good uh, discussion, technical side and whatever. But it's, uh, you, you miss something. You, you can feel that you are, you are an employee and uh, it's, it's different. It is very different, yeah. And, and just a quick word on Damon. Um, it was his first season. Yep. Um, I think he won three races. Yep. How quick was Damon that year? Or were you not bringing your A game? Oh, it was, a, it was, a, it was very, very uh, strange, in fact, because Damon was new. I mean, new. He was, he was not new in Formula 1. And he was new, uh, especially uh, knowing the car, because he has done a lot of tests with the active suspension. And it's not a secret that I always said I did not like this car. I did not like the active suspension car. <laughs> that was what, what lack of feel. I, I was I had no feeling. I did not like to drive with the, with the, um, assistance on the brakes and the steering and the, you know the. 
I did not like the fact that I could not set up the car. I wanted to because it was Paddy at the time. He had to put, you know, bring the computer Paddy and yeah. said, uh, I did not like the car, you know, and, uh, f uh, uh, and, and uh, Damon has done a lot of tests with that. And obviously he was, he was well prepared and uh, he did not have the same problem. And Damon was much faster than I thought, you know, much better. Especially some tracks where I was really uh, difficult for me and struggling sometimes because uh, maybe because of the you know the car by itself. Uh, when we uh, at the end of the season when I retired and, and then we had uh, we have done some tests together in September October in Estoril with the new regulation without the active suspension. Pff, I love the car. Really, <laughs> I have done the the best time of the test and easy and. Uh, lot, uh, you know, uh, ahead of everybody, and I was really, but shit, you know, this this car is much better for for me anyway. But Demon is uh, Demon was a good driver. I was uh, underestimated in my opinion. Yeah. So you love the passive, let's call yeah. it the passive yeah. Williams. Yeah. I mean. Why not race it in '94? I mean, I've decided to stop anyway. Before I have decided to stop in in August. It went slowly during this uh, this this '93 season, so it was no no question. And when I have tested the uh, the McLaren, uh, because Ron Ron wanted to Ron came to me in my room the day the evening after I have uh, announced that my retirement. Where did you do that? In Estoril, in Estoril, 93. Okay. And he Gold said Gold. to me, Alain, I know why you do that. I know you, you, I know what you're doing, so you can't stop like this. You have to, so he made an offer to me. Uh, we, dis we discussed during the winter and we had a contract. And, uh, for 94? For 94 and, and beyond. That was obviously the best contract I would have never done financially from far, you know, and uh, I said, okay, we, we signed the contract, but uh, I said also, I want you to help me for the development of the car and you tell me what you think. We have done a, a three days contract for Estoril and during, after these three days, I could sign the contract, the official contract to stay or not. And after one day and a half, I said to him, okay, don't, uh, don't wait for the last, uh, I'm, I'm doing the three days. Because, uh, but uh, I'm not going to do it. You know, I, I, in fact, I, that was good for me to, to drive again to see if I wanted to do it or not. Uh, obviously, the car was not very competitive, and the engine was not very competitive, so I could not win again. And also the fact that uh, I had to, uh, I, I wanted to to change. You know, and, uh, I was more disappointed by the the environment of Formula One. Uh, not by the driving or not driving, you know. Driving is uh, is my life, and uh, working in the team, and uh, I've uh, I've done that also in '95, '96 at McLaren. I was still driving, testing, working in the team, really beside beside Ron as we were doing in the, in the past. We have done some very good things uh, together. So that was, you know, part of the, my life, you know, being experiences. But sometimes when you have decided something. Okay, you can see, okay, I've done it right or not, but it was re really the right decision. Did you miss driving? Do you miss driving now? No, no, I don't miss driving at all. You know, when I had the opportunity to drive my old cars, I'm happy to see what it was, I mean, depending the condition, depending the cars. But I drove also some modern cars in the recently, in the last few years, but I don't have uh, the same fun anyway, at all. Mm. Final thoughts. Brilliant, brilliant racing career, 51 wins, four championships, should have been nine, we've established <laughs> that. <laughs> but Alain, why uh, Cross Grand Prix? Yeah. What was the lure of, of doing that? You, you'd had such a great driving career to then suddenly go and get a proper job. <laughs> yeah, uh, having uh, the job or the, the working for me or if you have a, a target, again, if you have a goal, a challenge is, uh, is not a problem. I'm, I'm still ready today to work uh, if, if I'm motivated, if I find the motivation to work uh, 15 hours per day is not, is not a problem. It is absolutely not a problem. The, the challenge with the uh, Pros Grand Prix was um, it's a bit strange because it was, it was more like a political game also in, in France at the time. You know? We had the Ligier team 
owned by Flavio. It was a big chance that this team could disappear completely. I've been approached at the time by the, the French president, Jacques Chirac. And uh, Peugeot was with Jordan and they, want, they wanted to stop Formula One also. So in fact, we had in France a big chance that Formula One would not uh, would disappear completely. And Renault was not there at the time. No. So I've done that because I had the opportunity to do it, obviously, in a good way. Uh, that was a good way at the beginning. <laughs> uh, I will explain to you. Uh, and it was also, you know, a French team, a um, little bit like, okay, Formula One gave me a lot and I need, I need to give also something on the other side. Uh, that was really uh, naive in a way, you know, uh, because we had uh, the first years of uh, Canal Plus sign a new deal for the TV broadcast. So I was supposed to have Canal Plus for a big, big amount of money. We were having Peugeot, free engine, plus maybe some money, plus uh, the fuel uh, supplier, plus, well, let's say everything. But, but we had a French, uh, you know, typical uh, political game uh, in the middle of a discussion where, uh, where uh, the French president lost the majority, you know, and then everything disappeared. The deal with Canal Plus became half less, uh, the same with uh, Total, and Peugeot, I had to pay for the engine. You know, that started like this. So I did what not, year was that? That was 97, at the beginning right. of the year. Yeah. In fact, I've signed, I still signed the contract because two days before signing the contract, I said to the French president, I don't want to do it anymore because it's not, it's not what I thought and uh, we are going nowhere. He said, please do it for France. We will help you later on. And then I've never been helped, you know, in a way. Uh, that is the, let's say, the political aspect of the, this country is always like this, you know, and, and you, need, you need to have the support on the political game, otherwise it's very difficult. But when I realize that uh, it's a company, it's not a French, a French Formula One team, you know, my business, 90% uh, of my time was for the political game, for the, you know, the, the, uh, all the controls, what you have, the tax control or whatever, administration. And, but then you realize, one day I sit with Ron, I said, please Ron, tell me, how much you pay all the employees, how many employees you have, and tell me how much you pay. You know, he had at the time 600 people, was much less than, than today, 600 people or even more, say 700. I had 200, even 190, exactly. So we, he had more than the double, and we had exactly the same uh, money spent because of the social charge, charges, all, all the, these things. That, it is impossible, in fact, you know, to, to run a team in France today, if you fight against English team, and uh, it is it is impossible. So slowly I realized that, but then I had to. It was uh, I made some fantastic deal. I mean, on, on the marketing and business side, with LVMH, with Yahoo, uh, with big companies. But then we had a crisis. Internet. I sold some shares to Yahoo for a lot of money, huge amount of money that would have been very good for the team for the future. And then this deal has been broken by the, the cop, you know, the, uh, in, in, uh, because the, we had the crisis, the internet crisis becoming. Then I signed, I signed a deal with Al Walid just before the 11th of September, you know, to sell the team, to sell a big part of the team. So I was not very lucky at the, of this period because all the constructors, they were gone already in different teams. I was with Peugeot, I had to pay for the engine, I had to pay for the engine. Do you know how much money I paid the Ferrari engine in 2000? It was $28 million. And I had to pay $31 million the year after. I could not do it. I could not do it. So the people saying, you know, I was not a good uh, team owner, or I, 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 I struggled. Yes, I struggled, but tell me what to do. When you 
when you have to pay for the, you know, for, for because it's in France and you have to pay 30 million your engine, my my full budget, my maximum budget, I had 40 million euro. The maximum budget I had in one year, 40 million euro. And you cannot run the team with uh, less than 10 million. It's not possible. <laughs> wow. I can't tell you much more, but it's uh, very interesting because yeah. when people are complaining today about a few things, but... Uh, I was getting for the the commercial uh, the commercial money was a maximum 10 million dollar. Today the teams like me because we finished uh, one year we finished fifth would have would have received today maybe 60 80 you know so it's a different uh, different business but at the time uh, was not possible. It was just a frustrating time for you I suppose that that whole process It is frustrating I was uh, really happy when I when I stopped to be honest because yeah. uh, that is not a life when you know that uh, you can't uh, you can't get there when you know when you have a, you also have a lot of poly- when when Renault has decided to come back to Formula 1 it was also the end of the the support uh, it was uh, when, when you have no support you very difficult to fight you know like like else so uh, it's not a re- I don't regret any- anyway I've done it uh, it was a good uh, good experience uh, in my life uh, I've done many many different things with uh, uh, a lot of things that you don't know with a lot of success some less success it's part of the when you're an, an entrepreneur if you want to do things you have to accept that it yeah. cannot work all the time but it has not worked for reasons that I did not um, um, thought before, anticipate, anticipate yeah. it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Very frustrating. Yeah, very frustrating. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's the word. Yeah. Well, Alain, it's been such a pleasure okay. to speak to you. I must just say one final thought is um, Nicola, your son, you have three children. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, his his baby, your, your grand, you're a grandfather. <laughs> yeah, I'm twice a grandfather now. Twice yeah. a grandfather yeah, now. Yeah. But now his son is called Kimmy. Kimmy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Kimmy's yeah. a popular... You know, it, it's funny because when uh, uh, maybe five years ago, he said, "When I when uh, if I have a boy one day, I will uh, call him Kimi," and everybody laughed because I said, "Yeah, boy, uh, Kimi," <laughs> and then he he did not want to. Uh, I mean, we keep saying, "Oh, you sure about Kimi?" But I must say that Kimi is a nice boy. And, uh, We're talking about the baby now. We're talking about the baby, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's a good... Uh, anyway, I mean, it's not, they always say there's no comparison, but may, maybe, I mean, I've, I've met uh, I've met a couple uh, uh, where there are two, two children and one was Ayrton and the other one was Alain. Can oh you God. imagine? So when you have seen that in your life, I mean, you can accept Kimi with, without any problem. <laughs> Alain, okay. what a great way to end it. Thank, Thank you so you. much for your time. No Such problem. a pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. There you have it. Alain Prost at his most articulate and intriguing. The insight he gave about his and Senna's relationship, particularly in the winter of 1993, was especially interesting, I think. And it's clear that there was a monumental amount of respect between the two of them. Never meet your heroes, they said. Well, thank goodness I did. I loved every moment of that conversation. Thank you, Alain. That's us done and dusted for another week, but we have another big guest for you next week. So we'll see you then. And in the meantime, please subscribe and review us if you haven't already. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and your favorite podcast app. And I'd love to hear what you thought of that chat with Alain. So why not drop me a tweet at Tom Clarkson F1 or by using the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audioboom. Until next time, keep it flat out.